think we're recording now. Just have a few minutes to start, so I'll just do announcements. That way, anybody watching the video can still get the announcements. So the first obvious one is it will be in writing. I've said it a few times and updated a few times more. The exam is on Monday. Um, just like normal exams, at least it'll open at 8 o'clock a.m. online. Um, it'll be a little bit longer, and I'll write. I'll find out exactly how long it is. An hour and 50 minutes instead of 50 minutes, but I'll write it. I'll, I'll put out a written announcement to let you know. But just like usual, you know, study the three study guides to help prepare. Um, study the first three exams to help you prepare because I'm literally going to take 50 questions from the first three exams and not change them at all. So you should be finding out the correct answers to your first three exams and studying them. That's the only ones you can memorize, actually. So if you're like me, when I was a student, I was really good at memorizing like, tests like that. Easy. It's a little bit harder when you actually have to figure things out. So the first half of the final exam should be easy if you're good at memorizing stuff. Just study your first three exams. Um, what else? Yeah, that's it for the finals. Any questions about the final? Um, if we don't have time to meet you for office hours, can we do an exam review online? Yes, great question. Uh, exam review. I don't know when it'll have to be. I'll find, it'll have to be sometime in the class, but yeah, I'll try to find the time to do it. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Another announcement. I just want to remind you, because a couple of you give me inspiration for this, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but to a lot of people, it's the end of the semester. You know, they wait till the last minute to turn things in. So I'm getting flooded with independent work, flooded with old labs, flooded with stuff from my other classes. So I'm here to help you, but I want you to know I need you to kind of try to be on your own. So for example, and I can still help the person who sent me this email, but I'm skipping over emails for now that you can help yourself. So if you like need to know where your grade sheet is, go to Google Classroom and scroll down. It's there. I mean, I'll still, for example, I will help you. But if you have any questions that need an immediate answer, and I'm not getting back to you right away, look at the Google Classroom, right? Use Control F, that's your friend. You can take control F and search it and look at the syllabus. Or turn to your classmates for help. But again, I will help everybody who needs it, but man, I'm just really bogged down right now. So any questions about that? All right, I'm dating attendance here. All right, well, any questions about anything before we jump back into chapter 20? Wait, so there is the exam review with that black individual base? If I can, so the question was, will the exam review be individual based, basically as a class? Sorry, they had this all the way up on the ADM. I'm going to turn it down to a brisk 72. Anyway, so the exam review, I'm hoping to have a big, a large one where everybody shows up if they want on mine. But uh, I can always try to do individual ones. Yeah. So if you need an exam review, just contact me and maybe we can find a time to work it out. So like if she needs it at Saturday at 2, and somehow I can pull that off, then I'll post an announcement like, hey, everybody, I'm going to be online with her at Saturday at 2 if you can make it. And if he needs one at Friday at 3, I'll say, all right, I'll do that. And I'll post it to everybody. It's like, hey, everybody, I'm doing one Friday at 3 with somebody. And he said, the, I already have a video up from last year, right? So just as usual, again, for the fourth time, I highly recommend watching those videos where I've done an exam review. Intent, right? So I've been making that hint. It's my fourth time now. Somehow it was over everybody's head. I'd recommend watching those videos. Take notes. All right, any other questions? All right, we're in the home stretch. Let's get back to it. So this is where we left off. And I was kind of in a rush because, uh, well, because of the timing. But also, everybody's pretty familiar with this, right? You already know, I'll tell them really quickly the difference between a food chain and a food web. The curve, because first we were just talking about the food chain. And that's when like, you can almost ignore all these pictures. As far as the food chain is concerned, we just looked at producers, and then things that eat those are called primary consumers, and the things that eat those are called secondary consumers, and the things that eat those are called tertiary and then quaternary, right? That's how we learned it for um, food chains. But then for this, I said, well, it's never that simple, right? It's always wouldn't more realistic situations of food web, right? So it's a little bit more complicated. You have primary consumers, obviously, eating producers. But sometimes you also have secondary consumers that eat primary consumers and producers, right? So we know it gets a little bit more complicated. But the one thing I wanted to point out here, keep in mind this is a simplified version 
I'm a food web. But going back to that idea of why biodiversity is so important, you know, if it was just a chain and you lost the primary consumers, excuse me, then everything above it would die, right? Because everything else relies on the primary consumer. Just as an example. But when you have a web, you lose maybe this. And this food web might be okay. Does that make sense? Because it's not a straight shot. Everything eats multiple things. Does that make sense, everybody? All right, so when you talk about biodiversity, think about it like this. The more things you have in this food web, the more safe and secure it is, right? Because you can take a piece of the puzzle out, and mostly the puzzle will be okay if you have a lot of puzzle pieces. Does that make sense? All right. Or if you think, of, think about actual puzzles, right? Like you have little kid puzzles that have, you know, 10 pieces, and if you take a big piece out, it's like, that's really going to mess the way it looks. If you have another puzzle that has about a thousand pieces and a piece that big, and you take that little piece out, it makes you still going to look okay, right? If that makes sense. It's one of the really important things about biodiversity is it helps the ecosystem basically not crash. It makes it more stable. I would go, could go on and on about biodiversity. It's so important, but we don't have time. There are some more things we're going to talk about with biodiversity, though. Um, actually, before we do, I'm going to of attendance, so the first attendance work for today, and if you're in the person, you can write these down for a little bit of exercise if you want, but the first attendance work for today will be ecology. Since it's right up there. Yeah, so for those of you in person, again, did you say ecology? And I can't, we can't see the screen. Anyway, let's talk back more. We're still talking about community ecology. Now we're going to talk about species Excuse diversity. So we already talked about diversity in general, right? Genetic diversity versus species diversity versus ecosystem diversity. So you know about those different things. Now we're going to go back and talk a little bit more about species diversity. As you already know from the previous discussion, Species diversity is the variety of species in a community or an ecosystem. But again, I think the thing to focus on here for the exam anyway is this part. Species diversity is the variety of species. Right? And the reason I'm going to leave it out is community is because you can look at it as a variety of species in a community or an ecosystem. Um, but yeah, it's a variety of species. There's two different ways to look at it. This is new information. You need to know the difference between these two. There's species richness, and then there's relative abundance. So species richness is the number of different species. So for example, in this bathroom, uh, on our species richness would be one, at least based on what we can see, right? Yes, there's bacteria and mold and things like that, but let's just talk about what we can see. It's only humans, that's the only species in here. All right, but let's say we also had this pet name that we could get you. He brought in his dog, and she brought in his cat, her cat. That would mean our species richness would be three, right? We have human, dog, cat. But that doesn't tell the whole story, does it? Because then, really, when you think about it, we have a lot of humans, well, relatively, a lot of humans, and then one dog and one cat. That's where this next concept comes in, relative abundance. So that's the proportional representation of each species. So again, if we filled this room with humans that have one dog and one cat, we wouldn't really say it's diverse, right? It's not biologically diverse. Yes, there's three different species, but it's like overwhelmingly a human and then one dog and one cat. So here's a good example. You link this picture. When it comes to species richness, these two woodlands are the same, right? They have the same number of species. It's a hardwood looking thing. Uh, and these two different, three different um, evergreen looking things. But it's mostly that hardwood looking tree, right? But here, the woodland B is more species diversity, or as you mean, um, relative abundance is more equal. And this is important. And again, if we have more time, I'll talk more about it. But again, the idea here is that when you have more species in an ecosystem, especially if you have a good representation of all of them, it just makes the ecosystem more stable. For now, we'll just leave it at that. Are there any questions about, again, species richness or relative abundance? All right, so here's a graph that shows this, uh, uh, this, these two woodlands. Here we have woodland A in this color, woodland B in this color. So you can see um, that for woodland B, everything's equal, right? Equal amount of trees, 
even though they both have the same uh, species richness, uh, relative abundance is more um, equal for them being. And that's a better thing. Obviously, I'll put a big X to this because there's not going to be a test question where I say, and without giving you this, I'm not just going to say, what has more, or what has better biodiversity? Who put A or who put Try to remember. I'm not going to do that. I might give you this uh, graph and ask you this question, but probably not even that. So, would anybody have any problem with deciphering this graph if I gave it to you? All right, there's another important thing to consider. Right, so here we're just like here we're just hoping everything equals out and we have a nice even number of species. But it gets a little bit more complicated that and also when I was talking about how you know the more diverse an ecosystem is, the more stable it is, and if you lose one species from a very diverse ecosystem, it's not as important because it's more diverse. But there are exceptions to that rule. That exception was called keystone species. You should, you should know this for the exam. Keystone species is one whose impact is much larger than the total mass or abundance indicates. So again, when you think about you know, that woodland A, the woodland B, the woodland B, right, everything was equal. So if you just looked at that, you would say, neither one, of, none of those trees are more important than the others, right? Because they're just all equal numbers. What we're saying here is that sometimes there is a more important species, and their numbers don't necessarily indicate that they're very important. A lot of times, unless you're studying the ecosystem, you wouldn't know which one is the keystone species. Your book gives some examples before I talk about it, I'll put it next to them. So I'm not going to ask you questions specifically about these examples. There might be questions on the study yet, but it will be on the exam. Not for these specific examples. I might give you some other examples and then have you recognize it as a keystone species because I'm describing the scenario. But anyway, so one of their examples is a sea star, right? Um, they did this as a real experiment too. This was not just a hypothetical thing that your textbook report about. Uh, they removed some sea stars in this uh, experiment in an ecosystem, not like in a tank, like in a real ecosystem. Um, and its main prey is the mussel. So once they removed the predator, its main prey obviously had nothing eating it, so it was just thriving. Because it was thriving, they outcompeted the other species. So remember what we were talking about the other day. That's one of the things we have to consider when we talk about community. Um, Interactions, right? They're all, all these things are competing. Take out all the other stuff, right? Uh, take out the muscle that was out competing it. Then everything else starts to explode, and it makes much more sense to see the picture. Actually, this is a different picture. Here we go. I'll come back to this picture. Here's the picture from your book. So, with the sea star, this is the ecosystem, right? You've got all these different species because the sea star was taking care of business, basically. But when you get rid of the sea star, then everything goes off balance. And this one, that's the picture from your book. Let me give you a different example. It's the picture that's not from your book, and it's a lot better. So this is a different situation. This time we're talking about a sea otter being the, uh, the uh, keystone species. In this case, the sea otter eats the sea urchins, right? So when the sea otter is around, it's eating sea urchins. There's not uh, an overabundance of sea can urchins. Can sea you urchins hear have it? the kelp. The kelp option in your picture doesn't show this, but a lot of Fish species rely on the kelp as it is to eat, places to hide. So anyway, sea otter's gone, then that means the sea urchin has no predators, therefore they go out of control, they start eating all the kelp, so you lose all the kelp. And again, what this picture doesn't show, even though it's better than the last one, is once you lose the kelp, you also lose all the different species of fish that were relying on the kelp, right? So here, we lost one species, which is the otter, and basically the whole ecosystem. That's basically what you think of, what you should think of when you think of uh, certain species. Right? So you lose one species, and it's not like you just lost that one. It was so important, and when you lose that one species, the whole thing collapses. All right, any questions about what a keystone species is? Um, can you hear us online? Right. We can't We've talked we about can't disturbances see the... before, but not in this context. Now we're going to talk about disturbances in secession and communities. All right. We were not in the biology class. What does the word secession mean? It's in line. Next in line, right? Yeah. Still, even though I have a doctor, even though I teach biology, when I read that word, unless it's in the context of biology, the first thing I think of when I think of secession is the president, right? So the president dies, the vice president gets in. If the vice president dies, it's what? Right. 
Speaker of the House. When the Speaker of the House dies, it's the Secretary of State. Whatever it is. So it's like next in line, like she said. And it's the same thing in biology. We're talking about next in line. But before we talk about secession, let's talk about disturbances again. Now, we've already talked about disturbances before, but we'll talk about it one more time. Disturbances are episodes that damage communities, at least temporarily, destroying organisms and altering the availability of resources. So uh, examples are storms, fires, floods, droughts. Just think of anything that just temporarily messes things up. Um, or right now, there's one going on in Hawaii. There's a, a volcano that's erupting that hasn't erupted in what, 40 years or something like that. That's a disturbance, right? Um, but they're not always bad. As a matter of fact, they're it's usually good, but you might say they're usually good. You can look that up in a bit more. Um, small scale natural disturbances have a positive effect on a biological community. And again, with the star, I put a star there because, like I said, it's not always beneficial, but usually it's beneficial. Again, this is a book example. Uh, if a large tree falls in a windstorm, it creates new habitats. And I'll show you what I mean on the next slide. For now, I just want to point some things out for the exam. Do need to know what a disturbance is? And I wouldn't say memorize those examples because I might give you a different example and say, you know, this is an example of what? You should say, oh yeah, that's a disturbance. Just think about something that just temporarily messes things up. I don't know, maybe even a, an ice storm, right? Just anything that just temporarily destroys partially an ecosystem. Same here. This example that I'm about to give you on this next slide is just an example. I'm not going to ask you a specific question. How many of you have, been, have had some time walking through the woods or you're kind of familiar with what it looks like? Right? So, some of you have. So, you know, like when you're in, in the woods, there's not a lot of grass growing, right? It's a big tree canopy. So, usually it's just big trees and a few saplings. There's not a lot of bushes, not a lot of grasses because there's not enough sun getting down there. So, Picture that, picture that you're in those woods, and that's this right here, right? And then this tree falls down, and now all of a sudden there's this big spot of grass, or of sun. Then you're gonna have some other stuff growing, right? Stuff that didn't used to be there. So what it used to have in that part of the ecosystem was just the one tree, at least that's how you can see. It's not talking about the other species you can't see. But now you've got more sun, so you've got more smaller plants growing up, and then all the species that eat those smaller plants, right? All the different uh, herbivores are now coming in because they eat those. Plus, not to mention, this thing has fallen over, and if you can tell, it's a little bit hard to see, but that was a pretty big, deep crater. So that's like a little pond now. So now you have all these aquatic species that live in there, right? And I'm sure this is casting a shadow, so now you have grasses, you know, thing that was, the things that were uh, tolerant of shade are still thriving there. The things that were not tolerant of shade are now thriving there. All examples. The point is, here we have this one tree fall down, and now all of a sudden we have this uh, a lot more biodiversity in that part of the forest, right? So the ecosystem has benefited from this small disturbance. There's a lot of other examples. You can look it up for independent work. Just look up the words, um, how disturbances benefit ecosystems. If you choose, choose some examples to write about. Or just list it off the ones you buy. So anyway, any questions about that? All right, moving forward, like we said, natural disturbances are good, but your book also points out that humans are the most significant agent of ecological disturbance. Put a question mark, not because we don't know if that's true or not, but the question mark indicates I don't know if I'm going to ask that on the exam. But humans are the most significant agent of ecological change. That would also be the next independent word, independent, uh, attendance word, the one that I'm circling is the next attendance word. Okay, I like this. So we're we talking about the emergence, uh, some of the consequences of um, humans disturbing ecosystems. And I like this because this was written prior to COVID-19. The one consequence of emergence is the emergence of previously unknown diseases. So I'll read through this before I talk about COVID. And I'm going to put a big X to this because, again, I'm not going to ask specific questions. But Three-fourths of emerging diseases have jumped from humans to other species. So those are called zo zoonotic diseases. Um, so again, COVID, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about later. Obviously, anybody know where AIDS came from? HIV. 
and from primates, humans eating primates, right? So that was a primate disease and now humans have it. Um, it happens when people come into contact with pathogens through clearing land, building roads, or hunting. Um, as a result of habitat destruction, it also causes pathogens from carrying animals to venture closer to human blood. So basically, as we destroy nature, and now we're coming in face to face with nature, we're starting to have this situation where there used to be things that were in nature, diseases that are in nature without jumping into, um, into the human population. So COVID's a big one, right? We don't know for sure where it came from, but one of the hypotheses is that it came from bats, right? So they had bats, and because they, I think they were even in, they were saying it was in um, what, Wuhan, China, and they were selling them as food. So here you have this crowded market of humans and all this food or all these animals. So it'd be very easy for that previously unknown disease to just jump into the human population. That's also a good independent work topic. We'll look into other diseases that were started in the animal, well, animals other than humans in the jump into the human population. Bird flu, swine flu, that's in the name, right? Those are obviously monkey box. These are all things that started uh, other animals. So again, the, the whole idea of this uh, slide here is as we infringe on nature, we're going to start getting new diseases. Which is obviously not a good thing for humans. Not good for the earth, because the more humans die, the better off the earth is. We don't want that. Uh, any questions about that slide? All right, now that we know about disturbances, we can get into ecological succession. This is a pretty simple concept. Uh, but communities change drastically following a severe disturbance. I'm not talking about a little tree falling down, uh, but like a big disturbance. Maybe uh, that hurricane that just hit Fort Myers, right? So we used to have whole ecosystems and also whole neighborhoods that just wiped out, right? Now it's nothing insane. So that's a good example. Um, the volcano that I'm talking about that's going off in Hawaii we probably used to have this thriving ecosystem. Now it's nothing but lava. Soon that would be nothing but rock, right? So anything that strips away vegetation and soil in this uh, context will be considered a disturbance. So obviously, once you wipe all the life away, then it comes back, right? So that area is then colonized by a variety of species, gradually replaced by a succession of other species in a process called ecological succession. So that's what you need to know. Ecological succession, basically when things are wiped out, and life comes back. Just like the political science session, commander in chief is wiped out and then it's replaced. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the succession. So far, are there any questions? Still taking. See if people take notes. I'm going to for it yet. Another thing I'll talk about, I don't have to talk about too much, is the people who know ecology can tell you by what's growing, how long it's been growing. There. So they can say, oh yeah, this ecosystem must be about 20 years old. Or this ecosystem must be about 50 years old. Or this ecosystem must be over 100 years old, based on the species that are growing. Because it's not like everything just pops up at once. So when you do strip mining, it's not like you know, oak trees are going to pop up all of a sudden. Or so it'll be the grasses and the you know, bushes and then other trees that do well in that circumstance. Anyway, there's two different types, types of succession. The first one we're going to talk about, you should know this one. Um, if I were to describe this scenario in the exam, you should recognize it as primary succession. And that's basically when you really start them, right? So, for example, we had bad floods in Kentucky over the summer. That would not be primary cessation. Yeah, we killed all the trees, bushes, and all that. You know, we lost a lot of that. When we looked at that area, you, know, still, you still have soil, right? You still have organic materials. You lost most of your trees and stuff. But when you lose almost everything and start completely over, that would be primary cessation. So again, this, uh, this is even a picture of it. But you know, when you have a, a volcano, for example, it's lifeless, right? As that lava goes, and then it dries, you got volcanic rock, there's nothing on there. And we don't have time to talk about it a lot, but when you think about it, there's no soil. So again, you're not going to have big things growing on the volcanic rock. Probably first you have a little bit of moss, right, because that doesn't require anything, some lichen, 
and then you get a lot of that stuff dying. So then you get a little bit of soil, then you can get some plants in there that can grow in a little bit of soil. So they grow and die and decompose. So then you have a little bit more soil and so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, this would be another thing to look up for infant work. What are some other examples of primary succession other than, uh, other than a volcano? I'll give you one more to kind of push you along with those ideas. Um, glacier is melting. So, you know, that's happening a lot in Alaska. You can see pictures from like 1950 versus now, where this whole area used to be under ice. Now the ice is gone, and what's left at first? Bare rock, right? Again, bare rock. But before we move forward, again, what you need to know for the exam is primary secession is when it's like lifeless, right? You got rid of everything. No soil, it's barren, barren wasteland. So, any questions about primary secession? Secondary secession is the other one we talked about. Now, obviously, a primary secession is when you're like you're completely starting over a secondary secession. Not so much. It's a disturbance that has destroyed the existing community, but left soil, right? So a fire, as you can see in this picture, so a fire destroys all the plant life, right? Everything's burnt. All the trees, all the bushes, all the moss, all the lichen, everything's burnt. But the ashes are still there, the soil that's under it is still there, so you're not starting completely over. And that will make a difference. So the things that start growing after a fire are different from the things that will start growing after a volcano. This is primary versus secondary succession. And again, a good ecologist can tell you by looking at what's growing and how big those species are. They can tell you about how old the ecosystem is. Anyway, that's it. It's pretty simple for the exam. Honestly, I don't know if I'm asking any questions about that because you guys are not biologists. It's really not an important concept. <laughs> well, I guess it could be. Yeah, I guess it could be. We don't have time to talk about why we're being clear. Are there any questions about primary or secondary secession? Or secession in general? Or disturbances in general? So, just for fun, Elena's more set when we put up a parking lot. Is that primary secession? <laughs> well, that would definitely be primary secession. <clears throat> then, you know, you I get don't think cracks. it's more set. Oh, it's not? Oh, well, anyways, like, you know, you get cracks in the pavement and then it starts growing. So yeah, exactly. A that's example. a great example. And that'll be, that's a great example, too, for this uh, non natural one, right? It's a human disturbance. Yeah, okay. exactly right. There's nothing but bare rock, right? So, yeah, a crack, you get a small crack in the pavement, you know, dirt starts flying around and fills the crack. Now you have a little bit of soil, so things that are good and growing, a little bit of soil will do. Actually, there's uh, where my kids go to school. Uh, great child care. Walk in the back door, right in the crack of the building of the, of the uh, sidewalk, and the maple tree around. blowing my mind. That's not a great primary succession species. Anyway, good question. So, no soil versus soil, basically. Essentially, as far as we're concerned, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. All right. So, we're finally done with the first two main bullet points. Now we're getting to the last one. I'm just hoping we can finish this chapter. Uh, next thing we're talking about is ecosystem ecology. So remember, population, just to remind you again, a population is when we talk about uh, members of the same species that are in the same area, right? I keep talking about the squirrels and those of you who get some scams. That's a population. Step up from a population is in a community. Then we're not just talking about all the squirrels on the campus, we're talking about all the living things, and the, you know, the uh, oak trees that it eats, the bushes that the squirrels hide in. And feral cats that are trying to kill them, right? All the living things in the community. A step up from that is ecosystems, right? So then you're not just considering all the living things, but all the non living things that affect them, right? The weather, the sun, humans driving by in cars. So here we go. Again, ecosystems. You need to know what this is. Again, so it's basically a community. A step up from that. So not just the biotic factors, not just the living things, but also the non living things. And I mentioned this in chapter 19. If you were to look really closely at the plants that grow on this wall, you know, right, right next to this wall of Hamblin versus that wall of Hamblin versus that wall of Hamblin versus that wall of Hamblin, they're probably a little bit different, right? The species of, of plants. Because they're all getting different sunlight, right? Some of these hardly ever get sunlight. Some of them get a lot of sunlight. Some of them probably get a lot of sunlight or a little sunlight depending on the, the, uh, the uh, season. 
those would be abiotic factors. But your book talks about abiotic factors and gives specific examples like energy, right? So like I was saying, how much sun is hitting it, for example. Soil characteristics. Um, so again, if water flows this way, which I imagine it does because the hill goes that way, you probably get a lot of water on that side of Hamlin and a lot less water on this side, which means your soil character is going to be different. And obviously, your water content will be different. Um, I'm going to put a dot, dot, dot next to this to indicate that's just some of the abiotic factors. Even fear is an abiotic factor. You can look that up in the, in the for independent work if you want. To me, that's a real fascinating one. Me. Let's see how we can do it. Uh, maybe the abiotic factor of fear, something like that. But fear completely changes ecosystems. And I don't have time to talk about it. Anyway, so any questions about what uh, uh, ecosystem is? That's the most important thing. You know the difference between a population, community, and the step above that, which is the ecosystem. All right. Um, your book talks about a terrarium, but as far as we're concerned, it might as well be an ecosystem. Well, it is an ecosystem, but a terrarium is a community that interacts with abiotic factors. Um, and I'm going to show you a picture of one next. It's a small scale, scale ecosystem. So just imagine that thing back there next to the uh, microscopes. I guess some of them might call it an aquarium. I guess it depends what you fill it with. If you put water in it, it's an aquarium. If you put soil and living uh, terrestrial plants in there, it's a terrarium. But imagine. We had that thing filled with some some uh, terrestrial plants and animals. That would be a terrarium. But here's what you do need to know for the exam. Whether we're talking about a terrarium or a small ecosystem or a big ecosystem, this is what you need to know. You need to know the difference between what happens with energy and what happens with matter, or in this case, chemicals. But in this context, it's the same. Energy flows through an ecosystem. You need to know that for, the, for an exam. The energy flows through an ecosystem. Even if you were to look at the Earth as a whole, as an ecosystem, energy comes in in, in the sort of, uh, form of sunlight. You know that through photosynthesis, that is then turned into chemical energy, the glucose and other molecules, and then that is eaten by things that then die and decompose, and then they're also eaten by other things, and the flow, energy just flows through the ecosystem one short level to the next. But ultimately, all that energy is lost. It's heat. Even though we don't think about it, Earth radiates heat. So that energy comes in in the form of sunlight and it flows out in the form of heat. Chemicals, on the other hand, for the most part, on Earth, don't do that. Whatever's on Earth is, for the most part, what's on Earth, right? We don't have a lot of things coming in onto Earth. We do have a few meteors and things like that. For the most part, things aren't leaving Earth, right? most part, other than spacecraft and stuff like that. So chemicals or matter, that's recycled in any ecosystem, not just the whole Earth, not just the terrarium. So again, for the exam, you need to know that energy flows through an ecosystem, and matter is recycled. I'm going to put it next to this, because your book is just using carbon and nitrogen as an example. And we'll talk more about carbon and nitrogen specifically, but it is just an example. Any element is going to be recycled. Any questions about this before I move on to the next slide and show you a picture of this? All right. Um, so then I'll just come up with a random word here for the next attendance word. Oh, yeah. Nothing to do with anything we're talking about, but that's the next word. So, anyway, here's a picture of what we're talking about. This is a terrarium. Again, it can be as small as a terrarium or the whole Earth. The concepts are the same. Energy is coming in, right? As in this case, light energy. Again, uh, photosynthetic organisms convert that to chemical energy, and it goes bouncing around the different trophic levels. You know, that, that thing eats it. As we all know, when you metabolize things, a lot of that energy is lost in heat. Only some of it is put to use. So then everything eventually is lost in heat energy. But again, this is a closed thing completely closed off. So all the gases that are in there are being recycled. As we know, right, the, the, the relationship between carbon dioxide and oxygen, right, between photosynthesis and respiration, those are getting recycled. All the phosphorus and nitrogen that's in the soil is going into the plants, and then those die or get eaten. And then they go back to the soil, and everything just cycles around. So again, uh, the most important thing is just a picture of what I'm saying, is that energy flows through an ecosystem, 
and all the matter is recycled. And you can look that up for independent work too. There's a guy who's had a terrarium, um, I think since 1972. I think he's only opened it up once since then, so I put it in water or something. But you shouldn't have to, right? Because everything, it's a self-contained ecosystem. It's really amazing when you think about it. But anyway, any questions about that? All right, we're still talking about it a little bit more. Energy flow and chemical cycling involved in the transfer of substances through trophic levels. So like I was always up, already saying, right? Um, the energy, the matter, it's all going through the trophic levels up and down the trophic level. So from the producers to the primary consumers to the secondary consumers, and then I don't know, the secondary consumers are proofing, so then it goes back down to the bottom into the soil, and then it goes back into the producer, right? It recycles through. Even the energy, again, it starts with the producers, it goes to the primary consumers, it goes to the secondary consumers. All the, all the time that's happening, you know, it's still being released as heat, right? So you lose some for each step. So any questions about that? So we're going to get more specific about it. Let's talk more about the energy flow of ecosystems. As you already know from the second exam, the whole second exam was basically based on this. That might be another good test question because sadly a lot of people missed it. One of the test questions in the end was this whole exam was basically about what and energy was the answer, right? I don't know how people missed that. Some people said evolution or Introduction like how we've been talking about energy, sunlight, photosynthesis, you know, respiration. But anyway, all organisms require energy. And if we take a closer look at the flow of energy through this ecosystem, we might come up with some questions. For example, right, there's a lot of producers, but there's not that many top level carnivores, right? So if you go, even if you've seen like nature shows of um, safaris, you just see thousands of gazelles and wildebeest and all those things, right? Thousands of them, as far as the eye can see. But then you just see like a few lines, right? So why is it? Why is there so few top level carnivores? We're about to find out. And then another question is how can we apply energy flow concepts to use our own resources efficiently? We're about to talk about both of those things. Um, so again, the only important thing on this slide as far as the exam is concerned would be this bullet point here. And hopefully you already are, you already know that. That was the big I said that's the one thing you should know from uh, exam two. Is like don't remember all the other details. Memorize that first. All organisms require energy. So let's talk about primary production. And we already have sort of talked about primary production. It's not in this context. When we were talking about photosynthesis, this is what we talked about. But now we're getting more specific. So specifically, the Earth gets about 10 to the 19 kilocalories of solar energy per day, which is the equivalent of 100 million atomic bombs, according to your book. But I don't like that equivalency because atomic bombs all have different um, strengths. But yeah, that's a lot of energy. I'm going to put it next to that because you don't need to know that specific number for the exam. But the point is, Earth gets a lot of energy from the sun. If you want to look it up for independent work, that's a great thing to look up. Like, look up some equivalencies that might make it make sense to you. So again, like I said, 100 million Atomic bombs, that's a lot of energy. So look at there's probably other ways to describe how much energy that is. Anyway, most of that energy is absorbed or scattered or reflected by the atmosphere or the surface. So of that energy, only about 1% of it is actually captured by photosynthetic organisms and converted by photosynthesis. So think about that. That's a lot of energy that we don't even use. So 10 to the 19th kilocalories a day, and we use about 1% of it. By we, I don't mean we, I mean specifically the photosynthetic organisms that capture that and go through photosynthesis and make <coughs> G3P, glucose, and all those other things we learned about. Uh, are there any questions on this slide? Some words you need to know for this discussion. First one is biomass. That is the amount of living, living organic material in an ecosystem. So you definitely need to know what biomass is. We were talking about the ecosystem of this room. I don't know how we would do it. Let's, just, let's just assume that it's only humans in here and forget about the, the microorganisms that we can't see. We would literally just weigh all of us and say, all right, that's the biomass of this ecosystem. Primary production is another thing you should know is the rate that producers convert solar energy to chemical energy that is then stored in biomass. Because remember, 
when plants make biomass, when they make those molecules, there's energy. Remember, way back when, chapter two, chapter five, chapter six, chapter seven, I said, every time you build a molecule, how much energy it took to build that molecule, that's how much energy is stored in that molecule. So, when we're talking about the biomass, it's not just mass, as you already know, all these bonds that are holding all of our molecules together, that's energy. So yeah, that's what primary production is, is how, basically how efficient um, the primary producers are in converting that sunlight energy into chemical energy. I'm going to put it next to this, because you don't necessarily need to know this number. It would be good for you to know it, but I'm going to ask you, it's a one much level for us. The primary production on Earth yields about 165 billion tons of biomass per year. That's a lot of mass. And also a lot of energy stored in that mass. <coughs> However, this is important. <clears throat> Different ecosystems vary considerably in their primary production. So not all ecosystems are, are created equal. If someone guess one ecosystem that's really high. Like what, if you had to guess uh, of an ecosystem, that has high primary production, which does a great job, produces a lot of biomass. Anybody guess what, what those are? By ecosystem, I mean like, um, you know, deserts, tropical rainforests, temperate forests that we live in here, temperate rainforests like in the Pacific Northwest, um, plains like in Nebraska, Iowa, things like that. I thought you say tropical, right? Yes, good. You are correct, we'll talk about that in a second, about why. You might want to guess which one might be really low, the one that doesn't produce much biomass. Dead, very good. There's some other ones. I'm going to put a big X to this again, because I'm not going to ask you to memorize this. Actually, I'm going to put a question mark at the end of this. I'm not going to ask you to memorize all of these, but at least know the superlatives. At least know which ones are the most and which ones are the least. Maybe I'll ask you that. So like you said, <clears throat> tropical rainforest. You know why? Because there's a lot of sun energy and there's a lot of water. Basically, there's other things too, but that's basically a temperate broadleaf forest. That's where we live, right? Those are high, a lot of energy, a lot of water. On the other hand, you've got tundra in desert, right? Not a lot of water in some cases, not a lot of sun in other cases. Or in this case, even with the tundra, the water that is there is not in liquid form, so it's not, uh, not useful for the primary producers. And then on the uh, that's the terrestrial side. On the aquatic side, we have algae beds and coral reefs are very high. Um, again, that makes sense, right? Because they're getting a lot of sun energy. And then you have ocean, open ocean. I guess we don't really have time to talk about all that. But if anything, again, I would know like the highest and the lowest, if anything. But probably not even that. So. That's what primary production is. These are the um, ecosystems that are really high on it, really low on it. Any questions about that? All right. Let's talk about ecological pyramids. And I already had a picture of an ecological pyramid on Monday, but now that picture wasn't from your book. Now we're going to have one from your book and actually talk about why it's in a pyramid. Remember, we talked about food webs, and there was no shape to that. It was just a picture of a bunch of species and arrows to show how they're connected. But this one has a shape. Shape actually represents something, it's important. So again, this bullet point's a reminder. Energy flows as organic matter through trophic levels. Another way of saying, like I've already said, primary producer, aka the plants, is taking that sunlight energy and converting it to biomass, right? It's building molecules, which is mass, right? And all those molecules, all the bonds holding those molecules together, that's energy. So it's not like energy is just traveling, going from plants to herbivores because it's like plugging in, like charging a battery, right? It doesn't happen that way. Things eat the plants, right? The herbivores eat the plants. So they get the mass, they get all those molecules, and then they break them down. And as they do, that releases energy, right? So, yes, energy flows as organic matter through the trophic levels. Simple, we've already said it, you need to know it. Here's what we haven't said yet, and you do need to know this too. A lot of it, most of it, is lost at each link in the food chain. So every time we go from primary producers to consumers, we lose a lot of energy. And we'll, we'll talk about why here in a second. Every time we go from primary consumers to secondary consumers, we lose a lot of energy. And again, we'll talk about why. This is a very important topic. 
even for you non-biology majors, this is important for everyday life. But we'll kind of talk about why later. So your book gives some examples, and it asks you to consider the transfer of organic matter from plants, again, which are the producers, to herbivores, which are the primary consumers. So on the next slide, we're going to specifically talk about why we lose energy going from here to here. And it basically holds true for each step in between the uh, all the notes. All right, so no questions about this slide? All right, in most ecosystems, the herbivores eat only part of the plant material produced. So again, let's, let's talk about, so the backup step, and remind you what we're talking about. We're talking about energy flow. We're talking about the fact that there's 10 to the 19th kilocalories of energy per day coming from the sun, and only about 1% of that is actually absorbed and put into the biomass that produces it, right? So you have all this biomass in the plants, Right? So you say, oh, that's a bunch of it. So again, what we're talking about here is where did all that energy go when you went from producers to consumers? Well, the first thing to consider is the fact that it's not like herbivores are eating all the plants. Right? So some of the energy is lost, lost simply because this is not used. This is still there. So that's one of the reasons. Another reason is they can't digest everything they consume. Right? So yes, it's taking in that biomass with all that energy built into it. But unless they can digest it, they're not you know, breaking those molecules down and not releasing that in. Just like even though we're not technically herbivores, we're omnivores, but when we eat anything that has cellulose, for example, like salad, right? If you're eating lettuce, cellulose, remember from chapter three, we can't break that down. It's a bunch of glucose molecules, but we can't break it down. We can't release that energy. So that's a good example too. Or a good reason too. And your book in specific gives you an example of this caterpillar. The caterpillar feeding on leaves passes about half of the energy of species. Do you know what I mean? Put an N with an X through here, indicating that everything I'm about to talk about with the numbers, you're gonna, you don't need to memorize. When you're studying, don't memorize these numbers. It's just concepts to think about. Anyway, the caterpillar that's feeding on the leaves passes about half the energy of species. So again, the caterpillar isn't eating all the plants. It can't digest everything it eats. So when it poops, right, it's losing about half of the energy, right? Half of this is gone. Half completely came in the body, went right back out. 35% um, of that is expended in cellular respiration, which makes sense because back when we were talking about respiration in the beginning, we were talking about humans, I told you, humans only put 34% uh, of that energy to use. The rest of it is lost as heat. So same here. It's using 35% of that um, energy expended in cellular respiration. About 15% of it is transformed into the actual biomass, right? So you eat, you are what you eat, right? The caterpillar is eating it, it's breaking those molecules down, it's building them back up and putting it into its own body. So therefore, it's only the biomass, and again, the energy contained in those uh, bonds, that is available to the consumer. So we have all these plants, we have the, the caterpillar eating it, but only a part of all that stuff that's eaten is going to make it to the thing that eats the caterpillar. Which brings us to this. It's very, very looking at. Um, so if we were to start, if we were to throw out a hypothetical number, 100 kilocalories to begin with, it loses 50 kilocalories as poop, right? It loses 35 calories in cellular respiration, right? In, in making ATP, which is going to get used, right? And uh, 15 kilocalories uh, for pro. So going back to this idea of the energy pyramid. It illustrates the energy that's lost within each transfer of the food chain. So each tier represents all organisms in a trophic level. So like I showed you that pyramid before, it just said plants, right? So that represents all the photosynthetic organisms in whatever hypothetical um, ecosystem we're talking about. And then above that, it said herbivores, right? So that represented all the primary consumers in whatever hypothetical ecosystem we're talking about. The width of each tier indicates how much chemical energy is actually incorporated into organic matter at that trophic level. All this is a long way, winded way of saying, the wider it is, the more energy that's in that trophic level, right? And the more narrow it is, the less energy there is at that trophic level. Because again, we lose energy as we move up the trophic levels, as we go from producer to consumers, we lose energy each step. As far as the exam is concerned, though, there's no real questions on this slide. This is a big, I won't say review, but basically, 
recapping what we've said. All right, so any questions about this slide? So again, these are numbers we've already said, but the book brings it back up, I will too. It's only about 1% of the sunlight that's available for primary production. Remember the rest of it's like scattered by the atmosphere or absorbed by the atmosphere. So all those of the 10 to the 19 kilocalorie that's hitting Earth every day, only 1% of it is actually available for primary production. Only about 10% of the energy available at one trophic level is incorporated to the next. You put a big circle next to that. You need to know that. That's a number you need to know. I've been telling you to ignore numbers, ignore numbers, ignore numbers. That's the number you need to know. Only about 10% of the energy available at one trophic level goes into the next. So if there was 100 kilocalories of producers, then the next step, right, you would only get 10% of that, so 10 kilocalories, and the consumers, primary consumers. And then the next one, you'd have secondary consumers, where they'd only be one kilocalorie, right? So know that number, but I like how your book does point out, I'm going to put it next to this, because this is the number I don't want you to know, because I won't be that confident, that detailed in the exam, but the actual numbers vary between ecosystems, obviously, between species, it's usually about 5 to 20%. But for the purposes of the exam, we're going to say 10%. Which obviously means, and I'm not going to test you on this other number, this is the other side of it, right? That means only about 80 to 95, or excuse me, 80 to 95% of the energy never reaches the next um, step, right? So it's just lost as heat, which I'll show you right here, right? So if we have 10,000 kilocalories of biomass in those producers, no, there's going to be 1,000 kilocalories left in the um, herbivores, right? And the rest of it is lost as heat. And then to the next one, right, the secondary consumers, there's only 100 kilocalories left, and the rest is left as heat. And then the very top, which is the tertiary consumer, sometimes quaternary, we only have 10 kilocalories left. Each time, you know, heat is just a lost as heat. So any questions about this picture? Again, these are just examples. I'm going to put an X to it because that was any number. I'm not going to. It's not like every ecosystem has 10,000 kilocalories. Right? This is just an example. It could be a million kilocalories. It could be 10 kilocalories. It all depends on the ecosystem you're looking at. This is just showing you the numbers 10% at each step. Which also goes back to why there's only there's so few top level predators compared to primary consumers. Because the energy available to top level consumers is small compared to the energy available to the lower level consumers. So again, thinking about Africa safaris, as you've all seen on TV, there's a very few lions, but a ton of things eating the grass. I wish we could go on, but that's it for today. The last word for attendance is going to be chain. Um, yeah, so that's it. I'll be online for office hours. For those of you who have WPSU stuff on, if you want to take a picture out of that, and for those of you who don't have any, uh, the PSU stuff. I can use somebody to take a picture.